Hello YouTube, welcome back. This is part three of creating a replica of the Sutton Hoo chain. So as in the previous two parts we're working in wrought iron and as you can see from this drawing by Mrs Valerie Fenwick it is quite a nice elaborate piece of ironwork. We're still on the second element which we will finish today in this episode which is a wrought iron plate with some nice side pieces. So today we're going to be working on the side pieces. Here's the plated element, which is a bit chunkier than the original. But we are basically going to add the fullered side pieces to it. So to create these fullered side pieces, we are using some quarter inch by three quarter inch, I believe it was. Now, in order to obtain the correct measurements, I've done a quick chalk drawing on my old anvil. And we will measure that using a piece of string to obtain the length of iron that we need to use. Obviously it's got a curvature in there so it's going to suck up a lot of material. Radiuses always do. So I'm using a piece of string for this. Uh, I would advise using wire instead of string because the problem with string is that it tends to stretch and change your dimensions. Uh, now I don't actually have any wire stupidly uh, so I'm stuck with a piece of string so once you've laid it out stick it on a ruler and you will find a measurement of about 10 inches. Now I only measured to the start and end of the curves so I am adding two inches either side and that will give us the material to weld it into place and create the fixing points. So having measured out the iron I will chuck it in the bandsaw and then I will measure two inches down from either end and then measure down a further one inch to mark the start of the fullering. So centre dot the end and then I will centre dot roughly at a third from each edge so I have two centre dots and that will mark where the fullering starts and ends. So at that stage I will stick it in the fire. Now this is wrought iron so you want to work it quite hot. And I'm using a modified chisel which is basically being ground to a rounded edge. And you want to make sure you're giving your iron a good scrub every time. Uh, that'll save getting any dirty marks on it. So to start the fullering I've not marked up a line or anything. I'm going to do this by eye. Um, and I'm just putting the first row of marks next to each other, they're not overlapping or anything, or well, not by much anyway, and that will just give me an idea of where the line needs to be. So that gives you something as ugly as that. Don't panic, it'll be a lot nicer in a minute. So the second heat, you'll go in there and you'll join up those primary marks that you put in there. Uh, and I find that this is the best way to do this freehand. You can make a tool that keeps it perfectly distant uh, and they're quite useful for hinges but I'm doing this freehand because I've seen no evidence that the Anglo-Saxons would have had a guide tool. So you can see second heat, second pass, uh, the line's looking a little bit straighter so what we're going to do now is we're going to go in there at a decent heat and we're going to clean and tidy up these lines. So that is literally overlapping every blow. Uh, and they're overlapping by quite a lot and I'm moving the fuller forwards by maybe an eighth of an inch at a time and that'll just give me a nice smooth pair of lines. So as you can see here, rather a contrast to the ugliness of the primary line I put in there. So this is how it works for me. Uh, if you have a different technique that you prefer to use, go ahead and use that. Uh, it's all down to the smith at the end of the day. So at that stage I will take that inch at the end, those two inches at the end of the bar and I will spread those out. And this is going to give me not only a scarf to weld it to the braided iron, uh, it's also going to give me a means of holding the fullered bar in place prior to the weld. So again, give them a good scrub and I will now start bending out both ends of each bar. Uh, it's not a right angle, it's nowhere near a right angle, uh, but it's not 45 degrees either. Uh, you'll, I literally did that by eye on what looked right, I haven't got any measurements or angles for it, but I made all four ends the same. Uh, and that will allow us to then bend the bar itself in the middle. It's important to get a nice even heat throughout the whole length of the bar on this. 
uh, but keep the ends as cool as you can. That'll save them from losing those original bends that you put in there. And that's just a case of going onto the face of the anvil and just flattening the uh, fish tails out. Make sure you're getting both bars to the same stage at the same time and that'll help you stay a bit more accurate. So the next thing is I will pop over to the cutting plate and I will just, using the cross peen, dish the fish tails. Now I didn't do this to start with, I could have done it before I put that original bend in there. It would have made this task here a little bit easier, however it would have made the bending a bit harder, so there we go, that's the order I did it in. So, and you want to do it so that it fits onto the braid like so. Now it's quite a loose fit at the moment, I'm going to close it up when it's in position. I considered using wire, uh, at the period this was made the Anglo-Saxons didn't actually have iron wire because drawing technology wasn't developed yet, so I'm just holding it with my hand, So, which is most likely how they did it back in the day. Uh, so at that stage get it fitted correctly so that it stays there, and then draw it up to a welding heat. Now I heated it up quite slowly because the fishtail itself is quite thin and I don't want to burn it off before both parts are ready to weld together. And I'll just raise a welding heat and just tack it together. So once it's tacked together I will do the same thing for the other end. So get a heat, get the fullered bar fitted, and then take a welding heat and just tack it together. So I'm not going full weld on this uh, because I want to preserve the thickness of the material. Uh, and then do the same for the other side. So fit. This one's a little bit trickier because the angle wasn't quite right. But just takes a bit of patience and determination. Could have tack welded it with an arc welder but would have made life a bit easier but I'm going as full Anglo-Saxon as I can on this. So once it's fitted give it a tack. You'll notice I'm using my light hammer here because I want to weld it not forge it. So because it's raw time you can get it hotter as well. So at that stage I've got that tenony bit left over, so I'm going to slice halfway through that and I will then fold it over and that will give me a bit more mass for that bottom element with a punched hole. So not doing any fancy scarfs, uh, I'm just going to faggot weld this. So up to heat and straight down. Because it's wrought iron it'll weld quite readily because wrought iron is self-fluxing so you'll notice that I'm not using any borax or anything silly like that. Uh, purely because you don't need to. If you control your fire properly, get a nice neutral layer in your fire, uh, you don't need borax. So at that stage weld up the other side and Bob's your uncle. So here we've got everything welded together, uh, we can start shaping. So the first bit we're going to do is we're going to, as you all have seen from the drawing, we've got this lovely rivet at the top, so we need to forge out the tenon for that. So literally give it a good scrub, and I'm doing this at welding heat uh, to save getting any delamination on this because I'm going to draw it quite thin. And just over the edge of the anvil do a double set down with your hammer i just start forging it out. Now you want to be careful that you're holding your piece of work horizontally uh, otherwise you'll end up distorting the whole thing. You want to control the heat as well. Try and keep it only hot in the tenon. And just keep going until until you've got your tenon and it fits. So, bonus if it works. So secondly we're going to do this punch bit at the bottom. So for that we are again going to work this at a welding heat to make sure everything's nice and tight. And using my big fat heavy hammer, I'm just going to flatten and spread out the material. Uh, we want a bit of a rounded pointy element at the bottom. So it's got a good chunk of material here. So, and again, you want to make sure you're holding your work horizontally. So 
so that you're not going to distort anything. So at this stage I'm going to balance it on the top of my pipe and punch the hole. So this is raw iron, it'll punch quite nicely. Lovely beautiful soft material and at the right heat it'll work like butter. Really enjoy working iron. So punch halfway through and then punch through the other half. Uh, you get a cleaner finish if you only punch halfway through rather than going all the way down till you feel the anvil. Uh, and then I'll just head over to the Pritchell hole and just spit out that slug. Like so. so a bit of a straighten, a bit of a dress, and then I will drift it out. Now this has got to have a forge welded ring going through it, so um, I'm going to drift it out quite big. And I think I drifted it out to 12mm, which is about half an inch. That'll give enough room for a ring to spin in. So with that drifted, as you can see the drift just went straight through, tapered both ends, so won't cause any problems coming out. I'll just dress the transition a little bit whilst I've still got a bit of heat in there. And there we go. The element is pretty much fully finished. Just needs fitting. So I've really enjoyed making this element. Uh, forge welding, fullering, bending, dressing, more welding. As you can see from the current videography, I quite like welding. And yeah, I think this has come together quite nicely. And it's nice nice to be forging again after uh, being off for four or five weeks. So, enjoy the images. Hope you enjoyed the video. Next element we'll be working on is the next one down. And there are three of those, so it should speed things on. But... Thanks for watching. Please like or comment. Uh, ask any questions that you might have. I might get time to answer them. So ask away if you have any questions. Uh, please leave a like or a comment on the video. Uh, helps me out a bunch. Uh, if you enjoy these videos and fancy supporting me, pop over to Patreon uh, where you can donate a small amount every month if you like. Uh, it all goes into making these videos. So here's my current list of Patreon donors. Thanks a lot, you beautiful, beautiful people. And I will see you all on the next one. Bye.